I'm going to call the meeting to order right now at 8.03 a.m. Um, and I'll begin by saying, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. <clears throat> um, for purposes of attendance, I can confirm that all five members of the school committee are here, as well as our superintendent, Dr. Daly. <clears throat> Before I just turn it over to you, I know you're still admitting a few people. <clears throat> Just want to make a couple of quick statements. First one is just I want to thank so many members of the public for participating in these meetings and in all of the parent sessions and the remote working group. You know, I think for my first three years on the school committee, there was about five people that went to any meeting. And so it's been nice to have a, a gathering here. At the end of the day, everybody on the school committee is trying to, you know, do what's best for this district and in order to do that, sometimes we do have to hear from you. And so it's great that so many people are taking the time, you know, even at eight in the morning to show up. <clears throat> I will mention that going forward, <clears throat> um, once school starts, while there's no definitive plans yet, I think the most likely plan is going to be that the school committee members will be meeting in public once school opens. Um, we'll be socially distancing and wearing face masks as well. But since we do wanna limit the amount of public that is in the schools, um, we will probably have remote participation for as long as we can. We'll probably continue remote participation for members of the public that would like to attend meetings. Uh, again, we, we like to hear from people. We want people to get direct information. And, and frankly, this is, I think it's important to hear what's going on in your kid's school. And so, you know, we appreciate you guys coming. Um, for purposes of today, there's three items on the agenda. <clears throat> we're gonna start talk, we're gonna first start with the remote plan, then we'll talk about the school calendar. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the special town meeting on Saturday. Um, and many people may ask why. <clears throat> Very generally, I think when the town is considering spending $2 million, you know, everybody that can use that money, I think, should be heard. And so I think it's nice to just talk very quickly. Um, in term, terms of how things go, as we've done in the past, while Dr. Daly is presenting, we're going to have him present first. If you have specific questions, you can type them in the chat box. So at the very top, you'll see a little thing that looks like a, you know, a speaker icon. You can type a question in there. If you would like to speak, just type your name or say, I have a question, something along those lines. We're gonna let Dr. Daly speak. We'll try to answer questions along the way. I will then call on the school committee members first. And, and you know, if there's any students here, I don't think we have a student rep right now, but, um, We'll do the school committee members first for questions, and then we'll hear the public. It is the morning, so we're gonna try to do this fairly efficiently. So if you can type the question, it might be a little bit quicker for us all. Um, and before turning it over, I'll just say, I, I hope the public understands that even though there's a lot of different opinions about you know, how to do this, there's a lot of concern about safety versus getting kids back in. I just wanna thank everybody. I think the administration has been great. The teachers union or the educators in our in our district, the school committee members, the parents, like everybody's been coming together. We all have differences of opinions about the best way to do it, but ultimately nobody is pouting, nobody is digging in, everybody is working to try to find a, a solution that works for everybody. There are no right answers. You know, the fall is gonna look different than it has in the past, but you know, I just appreciate all the different groups that have been coming together to try to make as good of a plan as we can. So that's my soliloquy to begin, and I will turn it over to you, Dr. Daly. To, well, actually, before I do this, just very quickly, the first uh, item on the agenda is always public input. So if anybody has something they would like to say about an issue that is not on the agenda today, so not reopening, not calendar, not special town meeting, you can type something in the chat box right now. And I'm not <clears throat> seeing anything. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Daly to begin on the school reopening plan. Great, thank you so much. So this morning, um, just to bring folks up to speed on the timeline, there were some deadlines and dates that have changed. And so what I'm going to do is present where we are with our reopening plan that would have been due on Monday, but is now due on next Friday, the 14th. The feedback that we were supposed to receive on what we submitted last week on the 31st 
um, will not be there. We will not receive that until Monday at 5 p.m. Um, so there's, you know, when, when we make the motion, we're going to have to think about that we can approve what we have, but with consideration for incorporating recommendations from the Department of Education. I don't know that we're going to have a tremendous amount. There's some generic feedback that they want us to make sure is in all of our plans, and that may require us to add one or two small items. But in general, um, I think we can move ahead with, with what's been shared with you here today. So I, I just want to start by thanking all of our members of our leadership team and our um, school committee, as well as our entire um, working group that has been meeting throughout the summer on this topic. And I've got those folks that are all named here. But we've had just a great representation of students, uh, parents, town officials, leaders in the community, our school nurse, school physician, board of health folks, um, our teachers union, our paraprofessionals union, all of our different organizations and staff members have been a part of this group to make rec recommendations and have really brought us to where we are today. So what this document is here that I will um, be sharing out likely Tuesday morning now is, is the plan to share this officially because I do need to hear from the Department of Ed to make sure there's not something that I have to include before I share it out. But what we've done is we've taken um, our plans and basically all the information about reopening to try to put it in one centralized place. And this will be a website that will be a prominent link on our, our main district site and the schools can link to it as well. Um, it begins with a letter from, from myself to the community, which will be shared out. Um, I'll skip ahead of the, the main part of today's presentation just to show you down here. There, are, there will be frequently asked questions that we will continue to add to as those questions come in. We will continue to address some of the, the topics that are, that are included um, and add to that frequently asked questions. There is a list of resources here, the links to the most current guidelines from the Department of Education, and also some of our local uh, resources as well, including the, the parent forum videos, the PowerPoint presentation so that um, folks can review and, and check on some of that information as well. And then I also have included the preliminary report. This is what I sent out last Friday um, that, that really, I think, is what a lot of people were most interested in was seeing you know, what the model was that we were going with and how that would look. So certainly our final plan is going to have some more detail around that. So what I thought I would do this morning is is just walk the committee uh, quickly um, through the reopening plan that I've included here. This has contributions from all of our administrative team. Um, I, I, you know, we sub-assigned to the, the department leaders as well as the principals to develop specific sections related to their areas of responsibility. I just want to thank them again. They've done such a fantastic job developing something that's clear and, and concise and um, as I go through here, you'll just you'll get a sense of the flow of the document. I may make a few changes based on recommendations today, and some other some other pieces that we are still working on. As you can imagine, we are um, working hard on this every single day and trying to figure out exactly what um, what is coming next. So, what what you'll find when you go into the document is that there are the um, and, and by the way, I will be sending out this document on its own. Um, as well for, for folks to, to print or to download. So it will be in a, a, another form as well on Tuesday. So we've got the uh, executive summary, which again recaps and, and thanks all of our folks for who've participated in our reopening group. And what this does is it just brings a, um, an executive summary, the key points and what's new and different in this plan so that folks can follow along and read um, so this is the part I'm going to go through in the most detail right now. So the first part just explains what we did as a part of the feasibility study, how we came to a hybrid model, how, how we're involved, why, why this was the recommendation. There are some links to some sites. Um, John Hopkins published a metric recently that lists the states that are in a position that are safe to reopen below a 5% positivity threshold, and Massachusetts is one of those states that's included in that group. Um, also, the links from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Centers for Disease Control, speaking to their recommendations for reopening school, doing it in a safe way. We then go on to describe what the hybrid model looks like. Similar to what was sent out previously, there are going to be four cohorts. Cohorts A and B will rotate between being in-person and remote. 
Cohort C will be in person every day, and cohort D will be in uh, remote every day. Then what we have is a little bit more detail. This is an example of this at the elementary and middle school done by weeks, just to show you how that alternating um, pattern may look at those levels. Middle school would be following a day one, two, three, four schedule that would just go throughout the year. Elementary school would be meeting uh, every day. They don't have set days, and it would rotate through. The high school is a little bit different. They do have their green gold days, and so this is just showing an example of what three sample weeks uh, may look like. And I just noticed the typo there when I copied it over. So this should say sample week uh, three, I believe, so that it would go through week one, week two, and then week three. And that's how it would rotate. Um, so green gold would just go continuously throughout the year. And then the principals are working to ensure there's, there's a balance between the number of uh, days that um, green or gold or day one, two, three, four that students are in person versus uh, engaging remotely. As an update with student devices, students will have, um, we're going to extend our existing one-to-one -one program that's currently in grades seven through 12. We're going to include students in all grades, K to 12. And in the coming weeks, students who do not currently have a district issue device will be contacted about the next steps in the rollout process. There were over 300 devices um, that were distributed as a part of our uh, spring operations. And so the students that do not have a device in the other grade, uh, in the lower grades, will have another device um, coming their way. Devices, I will say, are on back order, and that, that is going to you know, interrupt some of our, our process, but we're going to come up with a timely rollout as timely as possible. My goal is to try to have something in everyone's hands um, as, the, as the first days of school approach in late September. So a, a large question that we may be seeing is, you know, will we transition to full remote or full in-person? And the district will consider a variety of health and safety benchmarks in order to determine whether they need to transition back to full in-person or for all students to go to remote. Both of these are possibilities this year. Of typical school year, but of course, there have to be certain uh, ben benchmarks and thresholds that we can agree to. Um, we will be working with the local town as well as the local board of health, as well as what's coming out from the governor and the Department of Education. So there may be, you know, related events just in our schools or district that we have to react to. You know, there is a scenario where, you know, there could be um, some cases that are in one school that we now need to quarantine and we reach a certain threshold where we no longer can safely provide in-person education. Um, in that school, if there's too many teachers out on a quarantine, for example, and there's not enough adults to stay safely with the children, then we may need to, to go to full remote for a short period of time. It may be just until those quarantines end and then everyone can come back to the model we have. So there's going to be some flexibility there needed. Um, th there may be the governor coming out and saying we're moving back into a different phase of reopening based on data that they're seeing. So we have to be flexible in order to move into these different models with our goal of moving back to full in-person as soon as we are able to do so. So as reported last week, there are some changes to the school calendar. I have the official calendar for an official vote later this morning. The uh, Commissioner of Education announced that the required number of school days for students is reduced from 180 to 170, and so we have to rebalance the calendar, change some of the dates when the quarters end, um, the main piece um, that I'll get at a little bit later is that, you know, if, if anything was given a little weight, it was for that first uh, quarter or first trimester, because there's, a, there's obviously so much new learning that students are doing just on the logistics uh, in the layout of the day, as opposed to the actual academic content. And so we want to make sure that there's, if there's any kind of extra time, it's, it's in that first part of the year, and we've rebalanced the rest of the year as well. The um, teachers and, and staff will be able to have training and professional development prior to the start of the school year to prepare for, quite honestly, a job that is that is a new job from the one that they uh, participate in every day. They now have to teach and engage students remotely, which is a very different um, task than, than a typical year. And so having that additional days of training should help to ensure that any portion of the year done remotely, whether it's the hybrid uh, school year or the full school year, is done well. The first day for teachers is September 1st, 2020. So teachers will be coming back September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. 
which then allows us to um, start the students on September 17th. We had to apply for a waiver for that date. The commissioner had said all school, all students must be back on September 16th, but I was able to apply for and get the waiver for the one additional day. So on September 17th, cohorts B and C will be in person and cohorts A and D will be remote. Then on September 21st, the next Monday, cohort A will be in person along with cohort C and then cohort B and D are remote. And just to go back to our, our schedule that we had earlier, that's that would be in alignment with this model here. Maybe this one's the most clear. So Thursday and Friday when we start, it's cohort B in person and A is remote. And then when we come back the following Monday, it's A in person and B is in remote. And then our plan is for September 14th, 15th, and 16th, that there will be some opportunities for students to attend in small groups to um, try out the, the experience of riding the bus or coming into class, learning the entrances and exits that may be particular to their grade or where their bus enters the school. They will learn the you know, flow of the school. There may be some different um, one-way hallways or just the whole process for what the school day will look like to do that in small manageable uh, steps with the students on those first few days before we bring back um, approximately 50% of the students on the 17th. A lot, a lot of questions have come in about what personal protective equipment is required. So all students and staff will be required to wear masks that cover the nose and the mouth. We are, we are suggesting this morning, and I know this has been a topic of, of much discussion, uh, but all students by the guidance are required to wear, including students in K-1, are required to wear masks on the bus and entering the building and in any spaces where they're coming within a certain distance of, of the staff. And so what we are asking for, what we, when I met with the Board of Health on Monday night, uh, they also agreed that to, to make a standardized requirement that all students wear masks all the time is the best way to do this. But what's very important is to understand how challenging that's going to be for all students, not just K and one. I think all students are going to have challenges wearing a mask all day. And so our focus and our, our procedures that we're going to work on with our staff is that there's a, there's a big difference between a student who's refusing to wear a mask and won't follow directions, just like that would be in line with any student re refusing to follow any school policy, like, um, you know, chewing gum in class or, or, or listening to a, I was going to say a Walkman, but I'm dating myself, but listening to, to something in class they shouldn't be, um, as opposed to a student who's having trouble because the mask keeps falling down or it's hurting or they need a quick breath. I think there are very, there's a lot of difference between students who are having a challenge wearing a mask and meeting a requirement as opposed to someone who's flagrantly refusing. Um, and so we're going to develop a culture in our schools that, that is, is reasonable for students. I think it's reasonable for the adults to have a challenge having to wear a mask all day. That's not something we've ever um, become accustomed to. And we want to have a culture that allows for that flexibility. We want to have a culture that does not shame the students <clears throat> if they are unable to wear the mask for a few seconds. And I want a culture where a student is not so afraid that if her mask falls down for, for 10 seconds and she fixes to put it back up that she's now been exposed and she's going to get very sick. Um, I think we need to constantly promote that what's, what's out there is very clear that the more students that wear, wear their masks for more time, the safer we're going to be. We're going to get outside a lot. We're going to have frequent breaks. We're going to um, have a lot of opportunities for students to take a breather as they need to. And there certainly are going to be um, accommodations for students that have medical exceptions. There will be a process coming out that, that I will share out where, where students can um, put in that they, that they would have a medical exception with a doctor's note for their um, personal con condition or disability that would allow them to not wear a mask and we would make accommodations so those students are fully included in the classroom um, in a safe way. And so we certainly will have all students safely um, in a classroom in those situations. There are a lot of additional health and safety measures that are going to be throughout the schools. Our custodial staff have been trained as well to use the new equipment. We have, um, you know, we have like wands that they're going to be using in, in, in addition to their regular sanitation products. 
and, and learning about the differences and the approaches to cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing for all the different procedures. There will be additional touch points that will be cleaned regularly by both our custodial staff as well as a specialized crew. Signage is going to be available throughout the buildings. There will be physical distancing practiced throughout the buildings. Multiple entrances, as I mentioned earlier, and exits will be utilized. And all of our HVAC systems, air filters, and some other tools, we're looking at some different ionizers and air purifiers. Um, what we currently have has been maintained, updated, and we're going to have some new systems in place as well. And there's more detail on that, obviously, below. For COVID testing itself, at this moment, there is not a, uh, a requirement or a procedure for testing in the schools with tests being available where the districts are testing. I imagine that this is obviously, as we get closer to actually coming back, there's a lot more questions about what's available and how this will be done and if there will be testing by the school or at the school. There's a lot of questions around the, the finances around this and also the staffing and who would do that. There's also been some great questions that I've received from uh, students and, and parents and staff about whether there is any kind of quarantine period before a student comes back to school um, or a staff member comes back to school. What I've replied and what I'll continue to reply um, is, is that you know we need to follow whatever is out there at the state level. So certainly if you're traveling um, to a state that, you, that requires a quarantine when you come back according to Governor Baker's order, that certainly needs to happen, and I would hope that students or, or staff would not travel to any of those states prior to needing to be back in school. But we will have more guidance leading up to school around that. I think it's a, a very good suggestion, at the very least, if there's nothing out there. I think I would suggest that um, people would self-quarantine in the days leading up to coming back to make sure that when they come back to school, they haven't recently been exposed. I think we're going to have a much safer start to the year if we have something like that in place. Um, and that would, you know, in that in that instance, it would be a voluntary best practice. But I think it's a great idea that I believe one of our students shared. Um, but we will have very distinct practices for students who are symptomatic at home, at school, on the bus. A little bit different if individuals have been exposed to positive individuals. Different process, obviously, if there are multiple cases within a school or in the district. Another process, if there are significant cases or a rise in cases in the municipality, or obviously a statewide regression. To a previous reopening phase. So different responses based on different outcomes um, and different possibilities. We would not necessarily be suspending the entire district at once if there's one case in our school, in one school. So I think that's important. And there are, there are guidelines and guidance here that are linked that, that give much more detail about what the process is. We're also working with the local Board of Health to develop a process for contact tracing and um, that will be that will be shared soon that we're going to form a subgroup there to develop those those procedures and i think it's important to share that you know could this plan for reopening continue to change so as the circumstances surround uh, continue to change everything is in fluctuation positivity rates in north reading massachusetts or individual schools um, many aspects of this plan that we're sharing today are still subject to collective bargaining and that is ongoing so there may be some nuances that may change uh, from what's in here now. Um, one thing that, that I am going to talk about a little bit today is the importance of giving teachers time within the school day to collaborate um, and to make sure that they are what they are delivering to students is, a, is of the very highest level that it can possibly be. That is something that we did benefit from and worked very well for us in the spring um, is that we had some time built into the day for the teachers to to learn more about the tools they were using and to also um, collaborate with one another consistently. And that is something we want to build. But I will say that our, our schedule for the school day is going to look a lot more like um, a typical school day than it would the day in the spring was, was much shorter than a typical school, school day. So we're going to be much closer to the full school day, but we will have some time built in um, for that teacher collaboration in order to learn the best practices for teaching hybrid. Um, I think it's also important to note from the outset, and I will put this into the executive summary, it's something I want to add, is that it is required that students participate when they're remotely, and there will be asynchronous requirement, I'm sorry, synchronous requirements, live requirements um, for both students and staff. Attendance will be taken daily. It will be recorded whether the student was in person or remote. So I've received a few emails from parents who have said, is there a, a um, I guess, a, a, 
punishment or, or repercussion if a student does not report during the live sessions? And the answer is yes, that is clear in the guidance. The students are required to be in school. And right now this year, school is remote for part of the week. And so if you were in the cohort who's home, there is a responsibility to be online and to check in and to be participating at that time. If a parent would rather just um, you know, work with the student on their own time, then we're talking more about a homeschooling situation and there is a process to do that as well. But that does not mean that the students are engaged all day. It does not mean the students are getting screen time and it's, it's quite exhausting to imagine sitting at home on a computer for, for you know, six to seven hours straight. But what it does mean is at certain times throughout the day, there will be live interactions with teachers and those interactions will be academic and not just social emotional check-ins, not just how's your day going, here's your classmates, does anybody want to socialize? It's going to be around teaching and learning and academic driven content. And so because of that, that is part of the reason why we do need to have that professional development at the beginning of the year and then some time um, every day for teachers to make sure that they're able to, to deliver that to the students. So in addition to the executive summary, the letter that I have on the main page is also here. You'll then see that it's broken out into different sections. Our in-person learning model will describe that model. The hybrid model, we'll get into more detail of, of the hybrid program. The remote learning model will describe what it will look like remotely. And currently, the way we've done this, and what, what happens in the hybrid model will transition fairly easily to a remote model. It'll just be um, more of the students will be remote on more days. And we will do everything in our power to keep that cohort C, the students who are coming to school every day, who are going to be students who are in a substantially separate uh, special education program. So not every single student is on an IEP, but those who are in a specialized program. And those students will be notified uh, in the coming days about their participation in those programs. Our English second learner students, our English language learner students, as well as our um, pre-K students, foster care students, and our homeless students will be coming into school every day. And another piece that's very interesting um, that we've been able to do um, is to have our kindergarten students report to school every day. So there will be um, the, the opportunity for pre-K and for K to be in school every day. Um, what that exactly looked like and, and how that will play out is going to be developed over the next week. And I hope to have a parent, a uh, kindergarten parent forum, uh, hopefully like next Friday is the plan um, to be able to present to kindergarten parents. I know there's a lot of questions specifically around the difference between full day and um, half day kindergarten. And so we're excited to be able to share today that um, we do believe that students in kindergarten will be able to come to school every day. Um, and we'll describe more about what that will look like. These are some other elements that are required for the um, plan for what gets submitted to the state. The plan then goes into great detail. So there's uh, great detail provided about bus transportation, um, all of the way the seats and the ventilation, all the different pieces. This is now getting very technical. So what I brought you through before was sort of the 30,000 foot executive summary. Now we're getting into the, the details for those that want to dig much deeper. So getting into all of the um, great work that Mr. Connolly did around the bus drivers and the busing situation, how the buses will be cleaned, maintained, precautions for transportation, the route, the plans for the routes. And as a reminder, what I've said in our parent forums as well, the busing this year is going to have additional services. We're going to be able to provide busing for everyone who requested it. And in addition to our typical services, there is also going to be bus monitors and additional cleaning of the buses. So those two uh, services will cost additional um, funds for the district. And that's why our bus fees um, are so important this year and they continue to be. Overall uh, facilities cleaning, um, there's great detail here about how the schools will be cleaned and disinfected. The process and the frequency for cleaning everything from desks to electronics to outdoor play areas. A focus on what the deep cleaning looks like in between when the cohorts change. We certainly will have uh, deep cleaning when, when approximately 50% of the students are going to change that are in the building between cohorts A and B. Talks about who's responsible for different pieces and also the different products and equipments that we've purchased and what those look like. Um, 
There's going to be hand washing and hand sanitizing stations, many more of these throughout the building than have ever existed before with hand sanitizer being um, on the hallway as you're coming into the, the buildings and as well as um, near the classrooms throughout the, throughout the schools. And then a more detailed um, investigation of the ventilation and HVAC systems in the district and what we've done in that uh, place. Signage, this is a description of the different signage that's going to be available um, for students to follow. And then some of the capital improvement product projects that we have going on that are COVID related. There's also then a, a deep description of what our food services will look like. We will have lunches available every day for students. And this describes some of the safety precautions that are being taken, whether we're eating in the classrooms, in the cafeteria. There are some different models um, and also some alternative spaces that have been identified where students can safely eat at a distance of six feet. They can take their mask down in order to eat um, at those distances. So we have different plans available. I think our schools will be utilizing a variety of ways to have students have lunch. Um, and so that's what's being presented in this section. Also getting into just the setup of the cafeterias, the tables, the kind of uh, protective equipment that our, our food services workers are using, as well as signage that's going to be present uh, throughout our, our spaces to keep them as safe as possible. More detail about special education services is in the next section. So special education services um, are described in great detail, nursing and health services, and then also our school counseling. There will be, in addition to our nurses, uh, we're going to have a, uh, one nurse at every building, which we currently have, and we're also going to be hiring an additional nurse this year as a floater who will be able to help with nursing services as well as um, specialized care and COVID-related needs throughout the buildings. There is also a COVID space for students if they are identified with symptoms that they will be in a separate isolation space that is different from the typical um, nurse's office. So we have that uh, space in every building as well. School counseling, there's quite a lot of detail here provided around what school counseling staff will be providing for staff and for students as they re-enter school. There's going to be a lot of needs for students that have been uh, removed from school for so long. There are students that have suffered trauma through COVID-19 and through school closure. And so we're very aware of that and we have a lot of services that will be provided. And it's described in detail here what it looks like when we resume learning, also what it would look like in person, what it would look like remotely, and what it would look like hybrid. And so I think it's important to differentiate those and, and ensure that there are ways for students to get those counseling resources that they need, as well as the staff to get what they need um, in all three phases that we're in. We then get into some very specific recommendations, schedules, entry and ent exit points, and some specific uh, questions that are related to each level. So it starts with elementary school. There's some diagrams and pictures of what a classroom would look like at three feet. Some recommendations that are described at what uh, will make everything work best and look best for teachers and students at the elementary level. Describing the hybrid model. Again, the schedule that I shared earlier in, in a little bit greater detail here with some uh, breakouts for what the remote learning would look like. So this is just an example of students engaged in you know, a 20 minutes for community meeting, at least 15 minutes for whole group ELA, 15 minutes for math, 15 minutes for science and social studies, and 15 to 30 minutes for some small group check-ins. So again, th those are the time frames that would be required when a student is remote. Um, that doesn't mean that is not the school day, because as you, as you can imagine, in a typical school day in person, there is a 20 minute piece of the lesson, um, let's just say 15 minutes for ELA, that's where the teacher would be engaging the whole group and then the students break off and do individual work. And so that's the same thing that would be able to happen in a hybrid model. There'd be 15 minutes of contact and new teaching. And then the teacher would say, okay, we're going to break into smaller groups. Some of those students may do that remotely. Some of the students may do that um, in person. And then the teacher is going to be able to check in with them and see how they did. And students will have opportunities to share questions. A lot of this still needs to be uh, worked out through our process, through our, our training with our teachers as well. Okay, so this describes the expectations for students and for staff in remote learning. Also provides an overview and some of the recommendations for all of these different aspects of social distancing, masks and face coverings, hand, hand sanitizing and hand washing, arrival dismissal, busing. So all of those protocols are laid out for elementary. 
similar then for middle school and high school. It shows some of the differences in the in-person, the hybrid, and the remote model and what those will look like at each building. Describes the learning spaces, shows some of the middle school classrooms and what those look like. There are also some uh, daily schedules that are proposed. Again, all of the schedules are still being negotiated, but this is what it would look like with a typical uh, full school day. Um, and everything is laid out so folks can understand that. And um, there's also a, a vibrant pictures here showing some of the entrances and exits to the building that will be used this year that may be a little bit different um, for arrival and dismissal that's done in a little bit more safe uh, manner. Same for the high school. So very similar. There is that the description of the models in the three different uh, ways that's unique to what it will look like at the high school. Some pictures of what the learning spaces look like in the building. Um, the six foot model again is what we're able to follow in, in our classrooms. The daily schedule, as I showed you earlier, is, is here in detail, um, as well as some entrances and exits that will be used specific to the high school. The COVID spaces um, that are going to be used in the buildings are also described. And then the last section of the plan at the moment is the digital learning and technology plan. This, this brings you through all of the details around digital learning and technology, showing that not only the, the devices that we're using, but some of the models and the theories that are driving what we're doing. We're having a flipped classroom um, concept as we, as we provide professional development. We continue to focus on personalized learning. And all of these initiatives that we've been working on as a district are certainly uh, have never been more important than they are now in this hybrid model. Um, it describes the use of Clever and Chromebooks. These are uh, devices, the Chromebooks, and then Clever is a tool that we use to help make the navigation of the, of the web as safe as possible for students. Describing how we're using Google Meet and Hangouts, uh, Google Classroom, using Google Docs, other tools such as Seesaw, Screencastify, Edpuzzle, Google Jamboard, so some descriptions of the main programs that we're using, some of the common platforms that teachers are using academically, Big Ideas, iReady, um, some of our other library resources that we use. Does describe in detail the student data privacy and process. We have been a member for two years now of a, a multi-district partnership that reviews all agreements with the vendors. We do not sign an agreement with a uh, provider, a, a software provider, unless they sign these agreements that have been vetted through the legal team of this consortium. And that's been a great way to ensure the privacy of our students um, in North Reading. Then some very granular detail about the student and staff devices, the technical support that they will be receiving and how to receive that support, and then some detail about the devices themselves. As I mentioned earlier, we are looking to give devices to students in grades K through uh, 12, and so there's some detail about what that program will look like this year. And that brings us to the end of our plan. Um, there is some great information throughout. There's a lot to digest. And again, this will all be shared um, with the community on Tuesday once we have the final approval from the Department of Education. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Okay, so we have one question here right now. If people want to type questions in, we will answer those questions along the way. And I'll call on the school committee members in a minute. I don't know, Dr. Daly, did you walk away for a minute? Do you have... Okay, so the first the first question is, will the same teacher be teaching both in person and the children at home at the same time? Dr. Okay. Daly? So this is one of those pieces that, that um, we are still working on and negotiating. What I've been uh, talking to all folks about, I've been on calls with teachers and staff at all three buildings, all three levels this week, um, as well as parents and students. The plan as we have described it, as we've laid out, um, would have that because I, I think there's there's many benefits to that. Um, there's there's obviously some some drawbacks, and one of the ch the challenge I'll start out with is the the feeling that you know how do I possibly do my job plus also teach remotely? And I think if you look at if you if you're trying to teach students the same way that we did uh, last February, and then on top of that you also have to engage with students remotely, I I agree that is double the amount of work. Um, but what we're trying to do is, is practice a philosophy of we are teaching differently now. We are teaching hybrid. So if you imagine that if, if we're in a full remote scenario, I have a class of 24 students, 
I'm teaching all 24 students remotely. I'm designing remote lessons. I'm having check-ins. Students are doing independent work, and we're coming back together to check in. I think if you go into the year with that mindset, that you're able to do that, um, and that's how you're going to work with your students. But in addition to that, there are some, um, there are some um, students that are in front of you, and you're able to work with them in person. I think it's a much more manageable task to wrap your head around. That said, I think especially at the younger level with the younger students, we certainly are going to need a lot of resources to be able to make that possible. So that is the challenge, I think, of trying to, to spread, to, to understand that and to share that. Um, but what, what is going to need to be done is um, to, to continue through negotiations to make that work. On the flip side, what that is able to get you is if teachers are able to teach one cohort, when we do transition um, back to in-person or into remote, if that does happen either way on the other side, it's going to be much more um, of a, a smooth transition if the teachers are keeping their typical classrooms. It's going to allow more students to have um, more electives because if we, honestly, if we get into a situation where we need additional teachers to teach both remote and in-person, then we're going to start using teachers who are specialist teachers, art, music, world language. They now would need to start teaching the remote sections of some of these other classes that are core academics. And that is getting uh, into a situation that I hope we don't have to get into, um, where, where teachers are not teaching in their areas of specialty and where we're not able to offer as many electives to those students. So I'm hoping that we can reach a, a process through negotiations where we're able to, to mostly have the teachers teaching their, their similar times. Um, the next uh, question is that there needs to be more information about specific health and safety protocols required for opening and remaining open for students and staff. Um, surveillance of screening of staff and students on a regular basis. So we, we have all that, that information about the, the metrics is going to be provided in the plan as far as the um, ventilation and the, the numbers. That's all that, was, that is in there that's been provided. So there's going to be all that detail provided. There, there is not um, specific numbers and specific thresholds have not been shared yet by the state. So I'm not sure what has been shared in other districts, but we are still awaiting those actual figures so that we can include them in the, in the, in the plan. Um, collective, uh, what is the collective bargaining timeline? Um, I certainly hope that we are able to get a, a lot done um, through the next two weeks. Um, we have scheduled, I believe, five sessions um, between now and, and, and the end of two weeks from today. And so that would be um, my goal. We, we're hoping to have all of the cohort assignments by um, hopefully by next week, if not the week after. But we are the principals. We're working on this very, very diligently every day to, to let that information be known. Teachers want to know what they're teaching. They want to understand um, what they've been assigned. Parents want to know um, all of those assignments as well. But we do need to get through some of those collective bargaining pieces as well. Um, and then what specific metrics we'll be using to guide our decision to remain open? Again, the, the main metric that I believe we're using is the 5% positivity threshold that Massachusetts is well below. Um, and, and the question is, the um, so again, that, that metric, what I mentioned, is, is in the document right now. So that metric of the Johns Hopkins number, the 5%, we are, I believe, in the, in the mid to high ones in Massachusetts. And so that is the metric that we are being told um, will be coming out from the state as well. The plan has not been approved by the teachers union. Um, that's not really the process. The process is that we, we, we come together to bargain those items that um, are open to collective bargaining. It's not the school committee would approve the plan and um, then we bargain the items that, that need to be bargained. But the, the plan itself, to my knowledge, is not approved by the union. That's, it's, not an, it's not a CBA, but we do have an MOU that will come out of um, our bargaining sessions. So not this particular plan, but whatever the MOU is that's, that's agreed upon. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Daly. <clears throat> Start going around to the school committee members. If people do have questions, you can um, ask them. Chris, I see you on here first. So do you have any comments or thoughts or questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Daly, I'm, one thing I'm wondering is, uh, do we have any data yet 
<coughs> excuse me, on what percentage of <coughs> on what percentage of school staff are in a situation right now where the policies of their home school districts will cause them to have to stay home with their kids and how that might affect our staffing needs? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear any of that question. Could you repeat the question, please? No problem. Um, I'm wondering if there's any data uh, being collected on what percent of our own staff are going to be in a situation where they will need to stay home with their kids due to their own uh, homeschool policies. You know, if somebody lives in Linfield, uh, I'm yep. just, you know what I mean? I do, yep. So that is, uh, that is certainly being collected and that is a part of the negotiation process. Okay. So we are, we are trying to come up with a few different ways to ensure that that is uh, not an issue for our staff. We have a couple of different ideas about how that could work. Um, but that certainly could be uh, a challenge um, and that, that we're going to have to address head on through negotiations. Okay. That was my, uh, my chief concern. The others were fortunately just brought up by members of the community. So I'll uh, yield the rest of my time. Okay. Uh, Janine, do you have any comments or questions? Sorry, I was just trying to figure out where my white mic was. I'm on a different um, apparatus. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of good questions that have already been raised, but one that I overheard someone talk about and I'd seen on um, the listserv is um, some towns or cities are going into hiring outside of the teachers union and is that something that is it even viable and why would we do it um to teach remote learning have you seen anything like that um on the listserv yeah i mean I, i've been a part of many groups and discussions there is there is an opportunity so the question about the students that are choosing remote and cohort d the state has, has helped us to understand what it would cost to, um, to have the students participate in um, a, a full remote program that is taught either by one of our teachers or we could also have it taught by a teacher in another program. And so basically we're buying into an online school um, for those students. That is a possibility and that's what we would have to do if we're not able to reach an agreement with the teachers um, that the teachers are basically teaching their full class. If we do reach that impasse, then those are the things we're going to need to discuss in addition to the challenges around um, the electives and possibly having teachers um, teaching. Right now, teachers are able to teach 20% out of their subject area. And there is a, um, a change in the regulation for this year, allowing them to teach at least 50% outside of their subject area. Um, what I've said repeatedly, and I'll continue to say, we have amazing teachers in our district and those teachers are specialists and I want those teachers teaching our students. I think that is our best bet. There's no, there's no one I'd rather have our students taught by than our North Reading staff and I, there's no subjects I'd rather have those teachers teach than what they are most qualified to teach. And so I, I, I certainly hope we can reach an agreement that will allow that to happen. Thank you. I agree with you too. So, but thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, before I go on to the remainder, uh, Dr. Daly, there's another question in there. About how many teachers, sorry, you go ahead. Yep, so how many teachers and staff are split between buildings? Um, we've, we've certainly discussed about this. It's, it's very few that are split between buildings. Um, and we've talked about exposure and, and limiting that. In some cases, some of those folks will be able to uh, virtually join classes. Um, you know, there's, there's different models that we're going to have to work out to limit exposure, but some of the specialists that, that push into multiple classes um, would, would need to be, you know, somewhat we're going to look at if there's a way for them to do some virtual pushing in so that they're limiting their exposure. But in other ways, um, some of those push-ins are the ways that we facilitate the, the, the contractual preps for teachers. And so that's another piece that we're going to have to negotiate because <clears throat> If we, if we are, are going to have to have the contractual preps, then we're going to have to have, you know, it's, it's great to be able to virtually push into a room, but especially with younger students, but quite honestly with all students, you do need an adult body in the room. 
Um, you can't just have an empty room with, uh, with, with teachers there. So we do need to think about that, and we do need to, uh, to work that out through negotiations. Um, but we are, we are looking to hire some uh, daily subs. We are looking to hire some bus monitors. Those positions are being discussed and or posted already. And so we, we certainly need more adults. You know, I think, I think all of this is a, you know, it's a fragile system that if, if um, students, as Chris mentioned, let's just say on a, on a daily basis, if a, if a staff member student is quarantined and now that staff member needs to quarantine, people may not be sick or even have symptoms, but they may need to quarantine. And there's a certain threshold where you can't run a building if you don't have enough adults. So the more uh, other folks that we have either in the buildings every day to help out, I think is, is very, very important. So um, I think that's something that we need to be thinking about as well. Um, is having first grade attend five days a week off the table? It was previously mentioned to try to get K in first to the school more. Um, it's not off the table. It's just it wasn't as clean and clear as kindergarten. So I was able to talk about kindergarten today, and we are still trying to get um, as many students in every day as possible. But first grade would be another uh, group that we are trying to look at to do that with um, space and the the numbers that I'm describing here today. Uh, that you know the actual adults to have in the room with the students is um, is in question. There's a question about do we have an estimated cost for all the additional requirements and maybe expect financial help from the state. So there there is there are uh, grants that we have received and we have. Um, you know, the, one of them was around $50,000, that's paying for the nurse. There's another one that's around uh, $500,000 that is paying for all of the, the safety. You know, most of what that's going to be used for is the, the PPE, the HVAC, the, all, of the, all of that, all of those systems, and then possibly some staffing. But the, uh, the, there's just such a cost to, to those items that we've had to buy that we've never had to invest in before that those grants are essentially spoken for before we start on day one. So if we're talking about additional bodies in the rooms, we're going to need to, to find some additional funding for that. And staff and substitutes will be properly trained on protocols. They may even be a part of, um, you know, Mr. Buckley has suggested several times that we bring them in during those 10 days. And if we certainly have our daily subs, you know, that's one of our ideas is to try to get more daily, I'm sorry, more building-based subs. That are, that are always coming to North Reading School so that they're not coming in from all over the place, um, we would get them in and get them trained ahead of time as well. Okay, we'll keep going around. Um, let's see, Diana, do you have any comments or thoughts, questions? Thanks, Scott. Um, no, not so much. I mean, this is very much so aligned to what we saw last week. Um, a comment that I'd make is that I'm really pleased to see that we've been able to pull in kindergarten. As you know, I'm a big advocate of having the younger students where remote work learning doesn't work that well um, be in person. Um, at the end of the day, um, I would like to see more flexibility around the remote learning plan for working parents. I think that's going to be very challenging um, and impractical in a lot of ways where I think the solution just falls back on, hey, you might want to consider homeschooling, which I think doesn't really solve the problem to kind of push people out of the district. Um, and then I also, I don't really understand all the details around the assessment of space, but I've seen other, um, whether it's Massachusetts or outside of Massachusetts, really look at space across the entire town um, to do assessments to see if we could get even more younger students in person. Um, wasn't brought along in that assessment to understand what was done, but just a couple of comments that are top of mind for me. But I appreciate all of the hard work you all have been putting into this. Thank you. If I could just uh, clarify a couple of things. So we are looking at, at spaces throughout. It's really, and we're, we're having conversations with our, our financial planning team about this today. Um, it, it's the people. It's the personnel that we need at this point um, in order to do this. So spaces, um, either in our schools or elsewhere, we have to think about the, the resources that would be the people because um, that's, that's the challenge. What we have explored, and I don't think I mentioned it today, um, that there certainly are opportunities that we're going to find through partners for what, what I've called remote learning assistance. So that would be for working parents as an option if you're not able to 
have the students at home. They may be able to go either possibly someplace in town or certainly to the YMCA. Um, for, for that kind of a service. At this time, I don't know whether that service would have a slight cost to it. Um, certainly, if it's an outside agency, they would, it would, there would be a cost to it. There will be before and after school programs, just as we have in a typical year, and we are working to adjust those programs to be on the same schedule with the hybrid model as well. That, that's something parents have brought to our attention. You know, if the students are doing three days one week and two days the next week, then they would want to have the program available in, in that, following that formula, and we will make, be making those adjustments. Um, but as far as trying to, you know, even if there is a cost to it, then I would try to figure out a way to um, offer, you know, reductions for those that, that would qualify for those to be at a different um, place. But I think, I think for those parents that are working, they, they would see it as an opportunity to have um, some changes there. And as far as the, you know, a second set of requirements around um, when students can, can access online learning, um, I, I know that I said that that's really um, a homeschool option, but what I'm referring to, to just to clarify is if a parent is saying because I'm working now the student cannot um, be a part of the school day and that that really can't happen. We can't have just students that are unaccounted for during the typical school day. So, you know, if we had that remote learning assistance, then therefore they are engaged during that time and we've just helped the parents to find some ways to facilitate uh, learning. I've had parents that have approached me about this concept of a pod where they're basically hiring someone to bring in to teach the kids in the remote days. We would work with uh, those folks if that's out there. And then also, um, as I mentioned, that we may have, we have some different options that we may float out there as well. And through those ideas, that's one of the ideas that I would float to help our teachers. Um, that maybe teachers with, with students in other districts might be able to take advantage of that as well. Um, let's see, there's been a bunch of questions that have come in here. Uh, if students are struggling with the remote portion, will there be plans to try to get them in more safely? So we certainly are trying to prioritize those students that are coming in um, every day. It's, you know, students that are really having a lot of difficulty with remote, um, either because of their disability or because of just the, the situation. Um, those are the students we will try to prioritize to bring in um, whenever possible. And certainly students that are receiving services that are best delivered in person, uh, we will try to get them in person as, as much as possible as well. Um, Dr. Daly, the, the one thing I would just add is throughout last year, we talked a lot about, we are all, all cognizant of, you know, we, students have been out for months and, you know, we don't know what that had to do with special education. and. So there's going to be a lot of assessment that needs to be done to see where students are at. And, you know, we will do everything we can in this, in this district to make sure that we support all students. And so, you know, there is something that has come up. I think that's one of my main concerns going forward is just making sure that we recognize students haven't been in the classroom since March. And, you know, we were all worried about coming back if there's going to be gaps and, and, you know, the gaps between the students coming back. And so I think that's one thing that I, I know that I want to make sure that we really keep an eye on. Thank you. There's a question about the, the number of students in cohort D. Um, I, I, I will figure out the percentage, but, you know, we've got about 2,500 students in the district, and there's about 40 to 50 students that have indicated that they do remote only. So a very, very small percentage um, at this time. And I didn't... I don't think I made it clear today, but I know I've said in the past, students that choose cohort D to begin with can certainly um, apply to come back in in person. There just may be a slight delay in making sure logistically we can figure out which cohort they will fit into. But if you, if you start off in D, you absolutely can start coming back um, more in person and it can go the other way as well. If you start in person um, in, in cohort A or B, and you feel that you're more comfortable working more remotely, um, you can transition to that as well. So there's there's certainly going to be um, that ability to, to transition as needed. Um, let's see, will attendance metrics for students and staff be shared publicly? Will, will parents be able to keep a child home if they are uncomfortable on a particular day versus choosing all remote? Um, I think that there will be that ability for, for students to stay home um, 
for any reason, you know, especially if they're sick or possibly sick or think they may have been exposed or, you know, we, we want students to stay home whenever they need to. And again, with that, that hybrid model where the teacher is teaching both the remote and the um, in-person students, now a student who's staying home on a given day is just, they're just in the same class with their teacher. Um, and to me, that's the best way to really um, approach this, as I mentioned before, where we're, we're talking about shifting space. So the time is set, but whether the student is in class in front of the teacher, whether the student is at home, and quite honestly, even if the teacher is home, if the teacher has to be home and the teacher is on a quarantine, let's say, but they're not actually sick, um, and they're able to, to remote in and teach that day and we have a substitute in the classroom, I think that could work as well. So now you've got more opportunities for your students to be learning every day from their classroom teachers. And I think that's the best model. So I certainly think there's a lot of ways to do that um, with the students. Families with multiple children would be the additional assistance for families who are helping two plus children with remote learning. Um, I'm not sure what additional assistance would look like in that situation, but if, if you mean, you know, access to the remote learning uh, assistance programs, um, I think that that certainly would be available. You know, if, if I had the funding and the space to provide it for free for everybody, I would. Um, but I know that I know that there's going to be a large demand. So we would we would, you know, have an opportunity in the next few weeks to figure out what the demand is and then to help figure out how to do this and where we can do that. But these are the questions that we are going to um, to decide. The question about how will parents communicate their selected plan. So parents are not selecting a plan. Parents are choosing. The only one that parents can really choose is D, and that was communicated out last week through the survey. And so parents should be completing that survey to indicate whether they are choosing D, which is full remote. Um, otherwise, we are assuming that students are in cohort A or B, and we will be letting folks know um, which cohort A or B they are in. Parents, obviously, um, it, it's, it's not sustainable to choose um, whether you want to be in A or B. We are assigning that based on a variety of factors, starting with academic and um, bus transportation, trying to balance our courses. Um, that said, if parents have a very specific request, they can email the principal, and we'll try to accommodate as many of those requests as possible. You know, we've seen some requests that are based upon um, you know, I, I carpool with so-and-so and, you know, we live in the same neighborhood and we really would appreciate being on the same cohort so that we're on the same schedule. We certainly will try to make those accommodations. And so the best way to do that is to, to let the principal know. Will there be emphasis on how to access the remote tools, Google Meet, Google Chrome? Yes. Um, they, they, they certainly will. I mean, we did this in the spring and we'll do this more, that there will be some professional development that is offered by our digital learning team for parents and for students to, to walk through that. And, you know, we, we have a smaller menu of tools that folks are going to use to make sure that they're able to access. And I also think by every student having a Chromebook, um, all of those Google Chrome tools are going to be more easily accessible. I think some of the challenges that folks may have faced um, you know, if you're trying to, you know, we went into March um, thinking that, you know, the iPad would work or the, old, you know, the older device now, um, the old, the old tablet I had around, we can make do with that. But once, as the spring went on, I think we saw that there was a need for a, a, a device for each student. The sharing of devices was more challenging. So I think having the one-to-one -one for every student is going to be a big help with that. But we certainly will have forums for, for parents and for students to, to navigate through some of these tools that are being used, and we would certainly offer them uh, on an ongoing basis for folks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Daly. Mr. McGowan said that he has no questions. Um, for my comments, I'll just say I appreciate all the work that has gone into this, and I know I, I on August 7th, students are going to be back September 17th, and people want to have a lot of information, but uh, unfortunately, this has to happen in a process where we start with what model, and then we kind of build it out. A lot of the a lot of the protocols are directly from DESE, so it's just you know doing the guidance that we're getting from there, and all of that has been slow. Um, as as you heard at the beginning of this meeting, Dr. Daly was supposed to hear back on 
our original three plans, and we haven't even heard back from that yet on if those models are acceptable. I assume they're probably going to be fine. Um, you know, I appreciate the work that's going into it. While you know, I personally voted no on going to a hybrid. I want to see as many students back as we possibly can have back. Um, I understand the safety concerns with you know with six, with three feet, and so we're we're in. This is where we're at. Where you know we can only have students six feet apart right now. I think the local board of health has now weighed in and said that they also think that that's a safer way of going. So, you know, this is where we're at. We're going to do the best to make this work. Um, and rather than just saying this is what we're going to do and then having pushback, I think the right way to go about this is what we're doing. You know, we have, you know, five two hour sessions scheduled over the next two weeks that, you know, Dr. Daly, Mr. McGowan and I will be in to talk about, you know, trying to get all these, you know, trying to work out ways that teachers think are, the best way to do this and the district feels comfortable with. So, you know, we're continuing to work on it, but, you know, overall for what we have today, I think this is as good as the plan can be right now. Um, and there's a lot more detail to be, you know, to be communicated out and to be agreed upon. And, you know, we'll just continue to distribute that out. I think that Dr. Daly's done a great job of keeping the public informed when decisions are, decisions are made and when DESE has guidance come out. And so, you know, I appreciate the work and, I don't have any suggested changes to the plan at this point. So, and just to, just to clarify too, from from what I'm hearing from from the state um, at this point, based upon those initial plans that came in, um, the, the the great great majority, like in the in the mid to high 90s, districts are looking to do in person or hybrid. Which I I would I would say from what I've gathered locally that uh, out of that, it's almost entirely hybrid. I'm not aware of a lot of districts that are going full in person. Um, and there are a handful of districts that are deciding to go remote. But again, that's at this time, it's a handful. Most districts are recommending a hybrid start, which is what we're recommending here in North Reading. So Mr. Buckley, is there, would I, would I propose the language for a motion for this plan? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think we're at that point. So what I would suggest is that we would say to approve the fall reopening overview as presented incorporating any recommendations from the Department of Elementary and Secondary yeah, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education with the understanding that the situation is fluid and changes to the plan may be necessary. So can I have a motion from a committee member? So moved. So moved as he stated so eloquently. I second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? So we're going to go to a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? No, Rich is on the phone. Sorry, yeah, uh, I'm an I. Uh, Diana? Aye. Uh, I'm an I as well. Um, so the motion carries 5 0 unanimous. Thank you, everybody. And. <laughs> The next topic on the agenda is the school calendar, which I think should be a bit quicker. We talked about this the last meeting. Dr. Daly, would you like to talk about the school calendar? Yes, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier today, the, um, the beginning of the year has 10 days of professional development days. The, um, you know, we take into account that the students would begin, cohorts B and C would be in person on 9-17. The first day of school would be on 921. On the other end of the calendar, um, we would be getting out a little bit earlier because of this. So the last day for students would be the 15th of June. But with five snow days, that would be the 22nd of June. So one thing that um, may be an outcome of this whole year, now that we are going and able to have some days remotely and some students learning remotely, is that if we do have a snow day and it's not a catastrophic power failure type of day, we may be able to um, kind of power through and have that snow day be a remote day for everyone. So there's a chance that we could get out as early as, as the 15th of June for the students. Um, what I've done in the calendar that, that you would be approving that I've shared with you is that um, a lot of the, the scheduled half days and full days are TBD. I think we need to constantly look at that schedule to see whether, similar to what we did in the spring, that we may need to use those days, but we also may be able to use those days as as full days for student learning. So there's some flexibility requested there. 
Certainly there are other uh, calendar items such as back to school nights and parent conferences that needed to be moved and adjusted because the start date is now later. And so when that calendar is approved and I send that out, uh, folks will see that. And certainly, um, you know, back to school night may look very different. It may be virtual, it may be different. It's not necessarily going to be uh, the, the in-person experience that it's always been because we are trying to limit uh, adults and, and others coming into the building in, in any shape or form. So essentially, uh, the major changes that we're approving is what we discussed at last meeting. Um, and the calendar would be to start school for staff on September 1st and for students on September 17th. Thank you very much. My only question on this, Dr. Daly, I'll just jump in very quickly, is um, for school vacations, I know last year when we were full remote, we decided to forego much of the April vacation. I assume that we are still planning on having scheduled vacations as we would any other year. Right, at, at this time, that is the plan. I think that there'll be, I'm sure those will be items that'll be discussed throughout the year. Um, and I think, honestly, we're going to have to check back in and see where we are, how many days we've had full remote, full in person or hybrid to make those decisions. So at this time, I think we leave the scheduled as is, and I'm sure there'll be much more discussion as the year goes on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, any questions, thoughts? No, it, uh, it makes sense to me. Okay, Janine. No, I agree with Chris. Um, no questions. Uh, Diana? None here. Rich? No questions. Okay, and I have none, no other. So if we can have a motion to approve the school calendar for 2020-2021. I move to approve the school calendar for 2020-2021. I'll second that, um, just noting that it will be fluid. Correct. Yeah, um, so on the motion, we'll do a roll call vote if there's no further discussion. Uh, Chris? Aye. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Rich? Aye. And then I as well. Motion carries 5-0 unanimous. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and <clears throat> the, last, uh, the last item up for the agenda here is just about the special town meeting, which Again, really, the school doesn't have much of a say in the, you know, everyone's dropping off now, which I understand. Um, I don't think Evelyn's school necessarily has a lot to say about a turkey farm, and I certainly know we don't want to run a turkey farm, but the town is considering spending $2 million um, on a turkey farm and with not, without a specific plan on what to do with it in the future. And so uh, I do think it's worthwhile for us to Ha take a vote on what we think, and then I know I know Mrs. Imbriano and I are planning on being at special town meeting on uh, Saturday. Hopefully, if it happens with weather, and we will plan on you know just communicating what we voted on. Um, I will just say from my my thoughts on this, I think again I think it's important for us to be you know included as a voice when we're talking about spending this much money. <laughs> the town currently has 19 to 20 million dollars from the sale of the Berry property which has to be used for infrastructure and it's very limited what it can be used for, <laughs> regardless of what it ends up being, whether it's an intergenerational community center, whether it's you know a new fire station or whatever it ends up being, eventually this town has a lot of needs that we hope you know that, that $20 million can go towards in the future. I think the concern that I have heard, which you know makes me think we should vote in favor of this personally is, <laughs> that whatever the needs are, all of them involve building new buildings and you have to find land. And it's not easy to find large plots of land in town. Also, there's talks about doing sewer, by bringing sewers to town. If sewers come to town, where it's going to start is on Concord Street from right around where actually 39 is. And this property is on the corner of uh, Concord and Park there. And so this would be one of those plots of land that would be one of the first to get sewers. So if you did want to build senior housing, for example, or any sort of large project, sewers are really going to be necessary and it's going to save a lot of money not having to have a wastewater treatment plant there. And so I just think, you know, personally, I think it's worth buying the land now. And if in 10 years the 
town decides that we don't need the property anymore, then it's land. Hopefully it's appreciated in value. Maybe the sewer's going in there and it'll be worth even more. And it could always be sold back, you know, and then, you know, to something else. I don't think it's going to lose its value over the next few years, but that's my thoughts on it. Um, I think it's worth the school committee weighing in and support or oppose, you know, opposition to it. And I don't know what other people think. Um, so I'll just kind of go around and see. Um, I'll start with Mrs. Imbriano because I know she was in finance planning team meeting last year when we discussed this a little bit and just curious what her thoughts are on this. Well, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, I think it's a, an excellent opportunity for the town and you said it very well, depending on what goes there, whether they sell it back to a, a motel or a outdoor mall or whatever, or they use it for much needed infrastructure um, I think it is a very um, good idea. Okay, so everybody else, uh, Chris, do you have any thoughts, opinions? I'm not, not particularly well researched. But, uh, it seems like a good idea that we can acquire this at a, at a fair rate. Like you said, there are lots of potential benefits to it. Yeah, and yeah, I, I look at it really as like almost diversifying the portfolio. Like if you have $20 million and afterward you'll have $18 million and a $2 million property. And so that's, that's really where, where I feel about it. And I understand there's a lot of discussion or, you know, a lot of diverse opinions about what it should be used for, but that's why I'm in favor of it. I'm not saying it's one use over another that I'm, that I'm proposing or that I, that I support. I just think, you know, we have to buy it now if we're going to buy it. The town has the right of first refusal on this, plot of land and so again that's why i think it gives us flexibility going forward um uh, rich do you have any comments or thoughts uh no not uh, specifically i think it, it makes sense too so uh, uh, i don't have any objections for sure. and diana same i am in agreement with all of you okay and so there's actually two different uh warrant articles the first one talks about the large piece of land that the town has a right to buy, which is doesn't have a lot of uh, frontage. The second article, article number two, talks about two specific um, plots of land that are have frontage right on Concord Street. Um, and so if if we purchase the one, then we're going to have the option to purchase the other two, the other two smaller parcels. And so the total the total cost is about two million dollars for it. So I'd like to entertain a a motion to uh, recommend Article One. So moved. I right, second. Okay. And any further discussion on it? We'll do a roll call vote. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. Uh, Rick. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Five zero. Thank you. And then I'll entertain a motion on to recommend Article Number Two of the Special Town Meeting Warrant as well. Do I have to read it out loud, or can I just say so moved? <laughs> you can say so moved. So moved. Second it. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well. So again, passes 5-0. And Article 3 is just about the operating budget. And since I don't really know what is specifically is in there, I don't think we should make a recommendation on that. Um, unless, unless anybody else disagrees with that. We don't normally in the past or haven't normally in the past. Yeah, I, I just don't even say what, what's being recommended, so I don't think we can recommend it here, so. Okay, is there any other topics or discussions that we have? So our Dr. Dale, our next regularly scheduled meeting, our next meeting will be our regularly scheduled meeting, I assume, and when is that? August 24th, um, as you suggested earlier, perhaps that will be uh, in person. We do have a financial planning team meeting uh, today at noon um, for a subcommittee meeting, but the next school committee meeting will be um, 
6 p.m. on August 24th. Okay, and this assumes that we don't, you know, we have a meeting on the agenda for before town meeting. I don't, I don't believe we'll have a quorum there, so that won't happen. Um, if we, if DESC has any changes to the plan and we need to revote this plan, we will give notice of at least 48 hours so everybody knows and we can come together again. I don't know on August 24th if I think we should be in person or not completely yet because if the schools aren't open until September. I just I just want to make sure they're completely clean when we go back into them um, or the, when the teachers go back into them. But we'll talk about that either way. At some point in time, I think very soon we will be back in person with um, hopefully with remote access for the public so they can still keep updated. But we'll talk about the means of it afterwards. Um, there's no other issues i will entertain a motion to adjourn i move to adjourn second okay so if there's no further discussion we will do a roll call vote rich aye Janine. aye chris aye diana aye i'm an eye as well passes five zero thank you everybody thank you dr daly for the hard work on this great thanks everyone we'll see you later on Okay. Stay Bye. safe, everyone.